So let's call to order the uh, regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, October. Uh, this is not October. This is November 16th. To order. Um, and before we start, uh, we're actually going to do something a little special tonight. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I would ask you all to stand, and those of you behind the screen, if you'll come to this side. Uh, we're normally we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, but one of our student board reps and also a student at Burnham Hills had the great honor to sing the national anthem at the recent IHSA State Volleyball Championship, Zach Kurzenberger. And uh, we're going to start tonight with the national anthem. So if you want to come around and see the screen, we're actually going to show Zach at the IHSA. Then we'll do the pledge. And then we've got one other little special thing that we want to do, and we'll start to regular meeting. So those of you behind the screen, if you want to see Zach, you can come around. But we would ask everyone to stand for the national anthem. Bo? that happened in France over the weekend. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I have the roll call, please? Stephen Arthur. Here. Jim Batson. Here. Alex Delipoli. Here. Pat Gertie. Here. Scott Luce. Here. Karen Lundstedt. Here. Ellen Maurer. Here. All right. Um, so our agenda tonight, uh, we will have uh, OCU recognition. Uh, lots of students here today. And, and I will say, uh, we're coming off a really high month here um, between athletics and record academic achievement, some unbelievable fine arts performances in both schools. It's like, wow, just uh, keeping up with everything. So if you haven't been part of all of it, it's been an incredible story. We're glad you're here to share part of the success with us. Um, I think we're going to have a great finish to 2015 here at the rate we're going. Um, no real update from the President's report. That was it. 
Um, we had extensive updates from our student school board reps, uh, superintendent's report. We'll open it up for public, public comment. I'm sure you're all staying and have plenty to say. Um, we will limit you to three minutes or less. Uh, the consent bill agenda is listed. We reviewed that last week in committee. We'll ask for approval tonight. We'll have updates from program and personnel, facilities and finance. Uh, I believe nothing from property. Steve? Okay. okay. And see you all. Okay, need a sub. I A S D. Nothing. Okay. And then we will have um, an executive session tonight, but um, there's no action tonight. Correct. Okay. No action after the uh, executive session. All right. Yeah, one other thing before we begin uh, tonight. Uh, many of you may not know, but um, November 15th is uh, School Board Member Recognition Day in the state of Illinois. And this day of recognition was set forth by legislation in 2007. That proclamation stated that school board members sit in trust for their diverse communities, meeting their community's expectations and aspirations for the public, uh, for public education. School board members selflessly donate countless hours to public service with no compensation. I want to emphasize that, no compensation. Uh, providing leadership that sets high standards for the education of all students. The end of that proclamation also refers to school board members as the front line of America demo American democracy. Local school boards are the citizens' direct voice in local public education, chosen to represent what the community wants and is willing to support. Quality public education is vital to the well-being of the community regardless of size or location. Jobs, public safety, housing, health care, and much more are impacted and influenced by the local education system. Whether or not you have a child in school, school board members need your support. The decisions made on behalf of the school district, its staff, and students are most effective when citizens can agree on what is best for all children. Today, nearly 6,000 men and women serve on 859 local school boards in the state of Illinois. Together, these individuals guide the education of more than 2 million students in 3,764 Illinois public schools. Our district, in any district, whether it teaches a few hundred or several thousand school children, relies on school boards to set the mission, vision, and goals so that every student has the best chance possible to succeed. School board members are your neighbors, friends, colleagues. They're everyday people who are truly everyday heroes for taking on this extraordinary and often complex duty, not for a paycheck or notoriety, but for the satisfaction of seeing all children excel through education. And I'm happy to tell our community members, particularly here, that are here tonight and also uh, who may be watching on video at some point in the future, uh, that we are blessed with one of the best school boards in the entire United States. And the result of our collective work together with administration and our staff and our incredible students and our parents and our communities are two high schools that are in the top 1% of all public high schools in the nation. And as Pat referred to earlier, when you look at academic growth, when you look at fine arts, when you look at student activities, when you look at athletics, and the growth that our students dem demonstrate in their four years at Libertyville or Vernon Hills High School is truly extraordinary. But I am here to tell you today, as somebody that's been in administration for almost 25 years now, that we would not be where we're at today without the work of the school board. And uh, I want to take a minute and give them all a round of applause for their work on ODF. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's start out with our uh, student recognition. Good evening. A couple weeks ago, uh, on a Saturday night, we had a pretty uh, amazing event. We were getting ready for the final performance of really a fantastic musical, Little Shop of Horrors. And at the same time, we had the police and fire and ambulance welcoming in a group of pretty special athletes. And tonight, we want to recognize uh, those athletes. Our cross-country teams have, for a few years, uh, been gaining in strength. Uh, and this year was no different. And so we have some uh, all-state individuals and some team accomplishments that we want to recognize <coughs> here tonight. So we're going to start off with uh, a male recognition uh, with, for an individual. So I'm going to call uh, Coach Mark Whitney up, and he's going to talk a little bit about Shane. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everyone. <coughs> Shane, why don't you come on up? Uh, this is Shane Williamson. Uh, Shane's a junior here at Vernon Hills High School. Uh, he had a phenomenal cross country <coughs> season uh, this season, actually following up a phenomenal uh, season as a sophomore. Just a couple highlights. Um, early in the season, September 5th, we were at the Fenton Invitational. This is an event that has been going on for 35 years. Shane ran the ninth fastest time in the 35 year history of that um, event. Uh, the next week, he was second uh, in a field of 920 runners at the first of the finish invitational, <coughs> just a couple of seconds behind um, the future state champ in 2A. Um, it was also the second fastest time ever run by a Vernon Hills High School um, student. It's actually, uh, Shane has the fastest time. He was uh, fifth in the NSC, all NSC, second in our region, uh, second in our sectional, just three seconds behind the eventual state champ again. Um, and for the second uh, consecutive year, he's an all-state uh, cross-country performer. He finished in eighth place uh, at Detweiler Park on November 7th. He holds the top three fastest times ever run at Vernon Hills High School for three miles and is the number 13 all-time uh, at the state final meet um, in cross-country. Uh, so it was a tremendous uh, season. Shane, congratulations. So on that uh, November Saturday down at Detweiler Park, not only was Shane doing some amazing things, but we had a complete girls team down there as well. And uh, we had uh, a couple all-state individuals and a team recognition uh, that is quite remarkable as well. So I'd like to call up Coach Suzanne Curry to talk about her ladies. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to thank you, uh, the board, for inviting us and recognizing these um, tremendous accomplishments by our athletes and thank our parents um, and the school for all their support we had a lot of support from the school and we've got amazing parents that come out and stand out in terrible weather travel hours and hours to watch their kids run for 20 minutes or 17 in some cases um, so it's, and it's it, it really means a lot to us to have them out there um, watching them do that and I want to congratulate coach Whitney and Shane Williamson on a tremendous season and also um, and we'll be recognizing the soccer team as well for their state championship. That's pretty incredible, too. So um, I just call up each girl one by one here. Um, I'll start with our alternates. We have a freshman alternate, um, Autumn Matuch. Um, our next alternate is a sophomore, Rhea Ramaya. Our next alternate is a freshman, Ellie Zazek. Alternate, a senior, um, Allie Spence. And our final alternate uh, for the season was a, another freshman, Caitlin Doler. So these girls, you know, they kind of pay the price for the season because they have to do everything that the girls that are running are doing. They just have to be ready at every moment, but they don't necessarily get the chance to compete unless um, called upon, and they were always ready. Um, in case we needed them. In fact, we did need Caitlin for a couple races this season, and she jumped in and, and did a tremendous job for us. So um, now I'll call up our, we're missing um, one runner. It's uh, senior Shannon Skio. She's not with us tonight. But next up, we have uh, freshman Vivian Chai. <laughs> Been in better shape before. <laughs> we have another freshman, Ryan Schofield. Another freshman, Hannah Ray. We're getting shorter as we go along here. Uh, next freshman is Peyton Mikowski. And then our two All-State athletes, um, sophomore Lauren Katz was eighth in the state with, I believe, the third best time for us at Detweiler. Come on up, Lauren. Athlete is a senior, uh, Vivian Overbeck. She was all state for the third year in a row, finishing in fifth place this year with an incredible time of 17 minutes 11 seconds for three miles. 
Um, that's amazing. She's going on to be a Husky at Northern Illinois University. We just did her signing this afternoon, and we know she's going to have a great career, and we can't wait to follow her there. So, Vivian Orbit. Prentice, you are truly right when you say we're having an incredible fall. In fact, Luke, I almost, I was hoping to get to see you at that volleyball tournament in person sing. But I really didn't even get to think about that too much because on the heels of that, shh, came our soccer team. You know, some principals might ask us what it feels like to have a state championship team. I like to call our soccer team the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> because I have to tell you, it's been so incredibly fun to go with you through all these honors. First of all, we start out with a great season. Then you lead us through the playoffs. You, oh, along the way, you also win the challenge, right? You win that big tournament. Um, then we come, they bring, what, nine fan buses? They can't even shake us, some of the schools we played. We're still out there going strong. Pardon? 50? 57 fan buses. I don't know where they parked those, 57 fan buses. From there, we come to the, the state tournament, and I, I can't tell you how incredibly proud I was. And it was really awesome to be on the sidelines and have somebody say to me, Coach Bitta was my coach. When it was <laughs> Don't that, say that. That, <laughs> that. that was an incredible moment, too. Then we come back, you police and fire escort home, we take you through the championship march, you're at the football game last week, and here you are tonight. We're so incredibly proud of you. And in that championship march, it was fun to walk through the halls with you too, Mr. Bitta, because I can't tell you, first of all, we did have to slow down the band a little bit, because yeah, they I were flying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were flying through those halls, but how many people in our building just have the utmost respect, respect for your coaching career? So I'd like you to come up here. I'd like to bring you up here, introduce your coaches and your team. Um, thank you so much. Um, last February, I had a little illness, well, pretty serious illness, and I told these guys I didn't know if I was going to be able to coach again. And to have this team win the state championship, wow. How, how, how awesome for a uh, career. And uh, every time I'm with these guys, I like to say, how about them Wildcats? <laughs> they were just awesome. We were conference champs, regional sectional champs, uh, super sectional champs, state champs. It just came out last week in the USA Today. We were the uh, number one team in the Midwest and ranked 13th in the country. Um, the guys wanted to keep playing to say, you know, we're not the 13th team, coach. We're a lot better than that. But there's no playoffs. But uh, it was just a phenomenal run, um, phenomenal young men. As Suzanne mentioned, the parent support. Uh, now you know why these young men are so great, because of their parents and the discipline that they learn at home. And then, it, you know, we won, but it was really pretty easy for me and my staff because we had such fantastic young men. And I'd like to introduce my staff. Uh, the older you get, you got to delegate more. And uh, I have two young men 
that have played for me before are my sophomore and freshman coach. Their teams went undefeated this year. So a lot of people asked me if I was going to go out on top. I said, heck no, I want to win some more. So uh, first coach is my sophomore coach, Andrew Bitto. Come on up. Second coach is Kevin Thunholm, does the freshman team. I can't say I'm the oldest one on the staff because Al Beard beats me by a year. Uh, he's been a head coach at two schools, Forrest, you and Hersey. If you put our two, his wife figured it out, Gail, that uh, if you put our two uh, win, winning uh, uh, seasons together, we have over 700 victories. So Al has been my assistant coach since 2007, and he's just, he's perfect for me because I kind of look at the glass sometimes half empty. He always looks at it half full, so we work real well together. Al Beard. <laughs> Jeff McKenzie has been with me since 1982. Now we're really aging each other, but he, he has a great mind. His two boys played uh, college soccer, and uh, he volunteered this year, and he was at every practice, every game, and he really helps the program, helping me make decisions. You have more people on the sidelines watching and, and knowing the game, and he, he just really uh, helps the program. Jeff McKenzie. <laughs> I'd like to introduce the varsity team to you. Uh, we got quite a few guys, but uh, we'll, we'll get them all up here. First off, I'd like to start in the back. Uh, Kyle Hall, who's a senior. Come on up, Kyle. Senior Jacob Rasmussen. Mike Riley, who's a junior. I'm sorry, Mike Riley. Mike Quigley, I'm sorry. Tony Bricado, who's a junior. Ryan Gibbs, Jr. Ryan Wintenbrink, uh, sophomore. Nathan Edmonds, Sr. Christian Long, Sr. Kevin Riley, senior. Tucker Gobler, senior. Darren Yos, junior. Pot, junior. Nathan Pachowski, sophomore. Congratulations, buddy. Dan Marks, junior. <laughs> Liam O'Connell, senior. <laughs> Thomas Pearson, freshman. Grant Kim, Jr. Grant Widmark, a senior. And one more. Max Freelander, senior.
probably have to slide your running. 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 Slide Okay, Karen, it's your turn. Go ahead. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, before uh, everyone goes this evening, I want to tell you that always our favorite thing to do is to recognize students, both the board and the administration. So these evenings are very special to us, but we don't want to leave this evening without thanking the folks that really made this happen. And we want to express our thanks and appreciation to your families for, as Suzanne talked about with cross country, and I know soccer parents have been to many, many games over the years uh, in less than great conditions, uh, getting you to and from soccer, not only here, but in Travel League and other places. And uh, we want to thank you for your commitment to your, your sons and daughters here uh, because it has certainly made a difference in their lives and it's certainly made a difference obviously in our two high schools so all of the athletes let's give your parents a round of applause thank you very much for everything. So as Pat said earlier, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the board meeting, but you're not obligated to do that. So if you'd like to exit stage right, you can do that right now, or stage left. You have to leave for rehearsal, so here. Okay, so, okay, so to start off, um, we had Red Ribbon Week recently, and um, we passed out bracelets and we signed pledges to stay drug free. And the bracelets were something new this year, so that was interesting and nice. And then also, uh, one of the days of Red Ribbon Week, we had the Healthy Lifestyle Fair, which was a great opportunity for students to learn about how to deal with stress, and also they, we got to try out things like the drunk goggles, and there were lots of prizes, and also we got a caramel apple at the end, which was nice. <laughs> um, and then we also had the National Merit Recognition Breakfast on November 6th, which was a great experience. The three of us really enjoyed it, um, except the part where we were put on the spot to like, say that speech. But other than that, it was really great. <laughs> Um, also, there was dinner and the musical for seniors recently, and that was an opportunity for seniors to watch the fall musical and eat dinner. Also, last week, all consumer classes got the chance to experience the interview process, so several companies came in, and students were able to practice their communication skills through that process. 
Also, veterans recently came in to talk to our freshman transition class to talk about their experience in the military, and that was also a great opportunity for them. And also, for a specific student, uh, Yulia Boyarski won second place in the art category for the 2015 Our First Amendment Freedoms Contest, which is sponsored by the Anti-Defamation League, Greenberg Triad, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, LLP, MASH, and the Chicago Tribune, and she also got a $1,000 award. It was a really great um, thing for her, and also she and Miss Malloy are going to go down and actually have their own special uh, day in the city to get recognized for that. So. Uh, this past week, our newspaper and yearbook classes uh, got to attend the National High School Journalism <coughs> Convention, which was in Orlando, Florida, a uh, nice change of weather. And uh, the association that holds the conference part, uh, pairs with professional journalists and educators to provide a variety of learning sessions and uh, workshops and such uh, for the high schoolers. And uh, they get to experience uh, a lot of that um, stuff at the convention. And it also includes um, all kinds of media uh, including newspaper, online, broadcast, yearbook, magazine, and so on. And um, last week, our marketing students also um, enjoyed a competition, the annual burger challenge at Tom and Eddie's. Um, competitors designed their own uh, burgers, their own custom burgers, and developed marketing campaigns for those. And uh, between the two burgers designed from our two marketing classes, 124 <coughs> total burgers were sold and a portion of the proceeds were all donated to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Uh, moving into sports, uh, fall sports have began winding down, as you saw the recognition for some. Uh, our football season um, made it to the playoffs for the first time in several years, which was a, a big deal. They uh, ended with a loss to Joliet Catholic, and um, we already heard congratulations to our girls cross-country team and, uh, and Shane Williamson individually for both their phenomenal performances at, at the state meets. And uh, girl swimming uh, is still continuing as a group of four girls took fourth place in the 200 freestyle relay uh, at the conference championship recently and uh, breaking the school record for the 200 medley relay. And winter sports are starting up. Um, <coughs> those sports include boys and girls basketball, boys and girls bowling, fencing, girls gymnastics, hockey, boys swimming, and wrestling. Uh, in fine arts, it's really loud. Um, <laughs> in fine arts, the musical Little Shop of Horrors was a success. The winter play is okay. The winter play is Twelve Angry Jurors or Twelve Angry Men. Um, it might be double casted. They're thinking of putting twenty four people in it. Auditions and callbacks are this week, and the shows are going to be in February. Um, ILMEA on November sixth for band, orchestra, and choir was a success. And um, Backlight Theater Company has a um, like a charity event every year where they do on Halloween trick-or-treat so kids can eat where we collect cans on Halloween instead of trick-or-treating not that we would trick-or-treat pretty old but we collected 2,800 pounds of cans this year for a local food pantry which is the most we've ever collected um, there's an orchestra concert on November 17th which is tomorrow there's a holiday choir concert on December 15th and the chamber choir Madrigal Dessert is on December 5th in first class, our first class program at school, our second first class Friday was themed hashtag VH Give Thanks, and we had a video where students called someone they were thankful for and surprised them with kind words and just thanking them, and it was really popular, it was very successful. And any tweets or posts on social media with hashtag VH Give this month are being displayed in the foyer to kind of keep the thankful attitudes around all month. And in student council, we have a variety show supporting our Cove School in Uganda on December 3rd. And it's a student staff variety show, so we have student and staff participating in acts. And then there's a holiday ornament sale benefiting the Cove in the foyer before and after that. And winter dance plans are underway. Pretty good. So for Libertyville, I'm going to be talking about athletics. So I'm sure you know a bunch of it already, but we want to say congratulations to the boys soccer team for winning the state championship, which is really cool because that was the first time any LHS boys soccer team has ever won state, so that was pretty exciting. Um, the boys basketball team has a tip off this Friday, which is like a scrimmage. And admission is free because I think they want to get like a bunch of people excited about basketball season. So I think they're having like free pizza and a bunch of games to like get people to go. So I think that'll be really fun. Um, the IHSA sectional meet on Saturday. LHS girls swimming and diving finished second. And now a bunch of people are qualified for state. So that's really exciting. And then D128 Special Olympian Chris Rose won gold and qualified for the state bowling tournament in Peoria on December 5th. 
Um, also at LHS, our first class, um, third period classes have started, and at LHS, um, we go through a project called The Wish, which is um, Wildcats initi initiative for sharing during the holidays. Um, it's when each third period class at LHS is given the opportunity to adopt a local family in need um, through the organization Catholic Charities um, during like the holidays um, by fundraising and buying presents for um, children and other necessities for like the family. And each year, um, LHS students have become increasingly competitive and clever with their fundraising techniques from just having bake sales and selling hot chocolate to putting together student concerts and even bringing in like a mini petting zoo last year. Um, so this season we're expecting a variety of new ways to raise money for our families. And um, next, Slant of Light, um, the LHS's student literary and arts magazine has begun accepting submissions for its annual magazine published every spring. Um, we're seeking various um, fun ways to widely publicize and promote it um, in an attempt to rejuvenate not only the club but um, our fine arts department because I know we have a very strong um, fine arts department and coming from me I'm the uh, editor-in-chief or member of the club this year so I just wanted to get it out there and we're excited um, this um, year to promote it <laughs> and um, the North Suburban Wind Ensemble concert is this Friday in the LHS auditorium including performances from local musicians as well as students um, Caring for Cambodia, a relatively new club at LHS dedicated to raising awareness about poverty and educational plights of millions of Cambodian children, has been actively fundraising for their trip to Cambodia in June to help build schools um, by, by organizing and hosting an ugly sweater run at um, LHS on December 13th, uh, which should uh, now be available on the LHS web store to sign up for. And we'll, we're looking forward to that, to see how that turns out, because that's something new. And they're also, they've also organized a toothbrush drive to send much needed toothbrushes to children in Cambodia. Um, the members of the LHS Jazz Band Ensemble One will be performing the Jazz ILMEA District Festival at uh, Niles West High School this Saturday. Um, and lastly, the three of us, um, Amelia and Nihar and I, have been hosting quarterly student leadership teams during our lunch periods in cooperation with the LHS administration to consider the opinions, uh, the, con the concerns, just to get general um, and honest feedback from our student body, um, mostly the most involved in our student body, um, regarding how their basic classes are being um, run or taught, how they received certain events and changes happening in and around our school, just um, and as a way to improve um, interaction between the administration and our student body. and. Um, we've noticed that they've been considerably more successful um, this year in regards to attendance and participation and um, honesty. So we, we really um, are proud of that. Okay. So continuing with uh, LHS extracurriculars, the District 128 Ice Cats team is having a fundraiser. Uh, really, it's a food drive at, at its next game versus Carmel to benefit the Libertyville Township Food Pantry. And uh, at the game, raffle drawings and silent auction winners will also be announced. And this fall, 17 seniors were selected for induction into the National Honor Society chapter for LHS. And Drops of Ink, which is LHS's school newspaper, has received a lot of national recognition lately um, with the National Scholastic Press Association awarding the now graduated Abby St. Clair as a national finalist for best news magazine cover design, and the local Kettle Marine Press Association awarded seniors Hannah Buford and Mike Gassick uh, best, the Best in Show Award, and uh, also Alex Zellick, um, as well as the entire staff. Um, and they received the uh, excellent award. And Connor Kennedy, uh, Maddie Salata, Abby St. Clair, and Kyle Laska received honorable mentions. Um, and LHS celebrated national um, French Week uh, with a daily theme to highlight uh, French architecture, uh, cuisine, music, dance, and architectural, uh, architectural history. And the LHS debate team has also uh, had a very successful season so far, and they have performed well at, at uh, competitions at FREMD and the Chicago Cat Catholic Forensics League tournaments. And at the FREMD tournament, uh, junior Connor Kennedy uh, was seventh speaker in the junior varsity Lincoln Douglas division, 
and sophomore Siraj Rajendran was fifth speaker and fourth place in the JV Lincoln Douglas division. And senior Emily Regan was fourth speaker and third place in the JV Lincoln Douglas division as well. And then uh, for the Chicago Catholic Forensics League <coughs> tournament, uh, Bert Cowell placed sixth and Andrew Klein placed fourth in the novice division. And Emily Regan placed fifth, Connor Kennedy placed fourth, and Siraj Rajendran placed third um, in Junior Varsity Lincoln Douglas. And uh, this November, LHS also uh, held its musical Starlight Express, and uh, the cast, uh, it was all on rollerblades, so the cast had practiced that, and that was really cool to see that for the first time um, in uh, a school setting. And last but not least, the Dungeons and Dragons Club is going strong and uh, meets every Friday, it has a lot of fun. So that's, that's all for LHS. <laughs> Okay, great job. And, you know, while I'm thinking about it, I also just kind of want to acknowledge, you know, we all get the e-paw prints that keep us posted on all the activities. So I just want to acknowledge all the hard work that goes into that to keep us posted. And uh, given that we have our distinguished Daily Herald reporter with us this evening, I'd also like to just thank them for the extensive coverage of all the fall sports and all the activities going on at LHS. And I don't know about you guys, but one of my morning routines is to run out to the driveway, pick up the Herald, and find out what's going on in the schools these days. So um, it's been a lot of fun to follow it all and uh, see how it's going. So thanks to you, Russell, and your colleagues for the good job that you've done throughout the fall season. All right. Um, superintendent's report. Okay, uh, believe it or not, more good news. Uh, the following students have been named Libertyville High School November Students of the Month. Ryan Herschel, Emilia Ruzica, Danielle Verba, Frank Saliba, Isabel Ferreira, Kyle Patterson, Evan Hurd, Hannah Harger, Jacob Mueller, Jamie Johnson, Elizabeth Ahrens, and Emily Sun. District 128 Special Olympians recently complete, competed in the bowling sectional tournament. Krista Rose won gold and qualified for the state bowling tournament in Peoria on December 5th. Athletes also receiving sectional <coughs> honors were Mason Reyes, who won silver, and Mallory Marvin, who captured fourth place. And this continues a long line of success uh, at the regional and state level in our Special Olympics program. So we're going to congratulate um, those students. The following LHS seniors were selected for induction into the LHS chapter of the National Honor Society. Gabriel Alesna, Josh Bragg, Mackenzie Cook, Tanner Doro, Marissa Garoppolo, Alex Gushalak, Owen Hassler, Gabriel Hauser, Abigail Jeffrey, Noah Motterwell, Ryan Moran, Alex Ovasapien, uh, Barack uh, Shimdahl, Kelsey Swiger, Alyssa uh, Stokovich, Ethan Urbanski, and Hadley Vanderbosch. And finally, LHS Social Studies teacher Kevin O'Neill was named a finalist for the 10th District Leadership Awards. The 10th District Leadership Awards recognize everyday heroes that make our community an amazing place to live, work, and raise children. The awards promote the public good and civic service by recognizing leaders in the 10th Congressional District. Over 200 nominations were received for this year's awards. So that concludes the good news. The board will note that you have one FOIA request uh, in your packet this evening. And Pat, that concludes the superintendent's report. Okay, thanks very much. Anybody from the public who'd like to speak tonight? Okay. All right, next, the consent vote agenda <coughs> is listed. Um, can I ask for a motion to approve items A through G as, as listed? As so moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur? Aye. Madison? Aye. Deli Pelley? Aye. Gertie? Aye. Luce? Aye. Rosedead? Aye. Mauer? Aye. All right. Motion carries. Program and personnel, Chairperson Mauer. Okay. We have <coughs> several items on this agenda. First, we have the 2016-17 curriculum proposals. We have some name changes and additions um, as are presented in your packet, and we're looking for motion to approve those. I move to approve it. Second. <coughs> Any discussion? Not roll call, please. Dadson? Aye. Daly Pally? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Our motion carries. Okay, next we have board policies, policy 2160, board attorney. <coughs> 
policy 2260 uniform grievance procedure and policy 7130 restrictions on publications um, they are for the second reading and adoption there have been no changes since the last time we talked about these last month so we're looking for motion to approve all three so moved second <coughs> roll call please Rudy. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Baskin. Aye. Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, and finally we have five educational tool requests that are listed. So we need a motion and a second to approve those educational field trips. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I just had a question. Is, mm -hmm. is summer 2017 really when they go like that far out? No, I think it's really it 217. It's a pretty big trip. <laughs> I think that's I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I'll go too. So. I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to go. I read the whole itinerary well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other discussion? <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Roll call. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Baskin? Aye. Valley Valley? Aye. Rudy? Aye. All right, motion carries. Any yeah. other? There's no other, so no we other. are finished. Okay, facilities and finance, <laughs> Chairman Batson. Okay, thank you, Dr. Crudy. Uh, we have uh, two items, uh, the adoption of the tax levy and an abatement for uh, from the working cash fund. Uh, or, yeah. We're going to get an uh, overview here. Dr. Lee? Okay. Uh, Yasmin's going to uh, pass out. The board is familiar with this document. <coughs> I want to make a couple of general comments as we're ready to um, go through the levy process tonight um, for um, the citizens are here and also the community. Um, our board begins their discussion on the levy in July, which is unusual for um, school boards. Um, we allocate um, a good chunk of time from July to tonight uh, to dig in deeply uh, into our finances and uh, also take a look at what uh, levy needs we have uh, for the coming year. Uh, the board takes that responsibility very seriously and we spend probably about 90 to 95 percent of our time together working on the finances of the district so uh, we want to recap a conversation we had at our facilities and finance committee meeting where we do um, most of the work um, on our uh, uh, financial uh, activities and also in program and personnel um, and review some of that work before the board um, entertains a motion on the levy tonight, the mechanical legal processes that we have to go through and they actually vote um, on the levy. What um, we want to point out first, I don't know if we got a pointer or not, so uh, that's okay. I think everyone's got the document, but we have it up on the screen here as well. There are a couple of things um, to um, note as um, we look at the levy. First of all, the levy that we're looking at tonight is or recommended is based on this work. Okay. So how do I point both? Straight up. Ah, there we go. So <clears throat> the levy that we're going to uh, look at tonight is subject to final board approval, of course. Uh, but we've had lots of discussion about this, um, and we'll go through that process later tonight. The first note is District 128 taxpayers approved a referendum in 1997 to issue bonds to build Vernon Hills High School and to renovate substantially Libertyville High School. The Board of Education um, voted not, over the past five years, has voted not to collect if um, they accept the recommendation tonight, um, over uh, 15 million, almost 16 million dollars in taxes and to pay referendum bonds from uh, existing reserves. During the five-year period from 2011 to 2015, the yearly average of abated or not collected taxes is uh, $3,700,000 roughly um, a year, and in percentage, that's 4.8% a year. For clarity, what we mean by the word abatement is those are taxes that the board could collect 
under the tax property tax cap laws, uh, or better known as PTEL, um, in the state, and the board has voluntarily um, made the decisions not to collect those taxes. If you go over the history and you look at 2011, you will see that the board abated $2 million, okay, and that resulted in a levy extension reduction of 2.7%. In 2012, the board abated another, or not collected another $4 million, okay, which is 5.23% of a tax um, levy uh, reduction. In 2013, uh, we took no action. In 2014, uh, last year, uh, $5.8 million, and that's 7.32%. But in addition to that, the board made the decision to reduce uh, the operating fund by $2.8 million, and they reduced the operating fund uh, by 3.5% on the levy for a total of 10.82%. And uh, what we're recommending this evening after, again, much discussion going back to July, is um, a $4 million abatement for this year, which is 4.97%. And again, that brings the total down to 4.97%. So if you look over the five-year period from 2011 through 2015, assuming that the board uh, approves the um, abatement tonight, the total between um, uh, bond and interest abatement and the operating fund levy uh, abatement last year is $18.6 million. So what that means is that the board could have collected $18.6 million more dollars in taxes than they chose to do, okay? So there are a couple of things also that note uh, consideration here, and we've had a lot of discussion about this, uh, and as our board aware, is aware, I'm very active working with our legislators um, in Springfield. And I wish I had uh, better news to report to you tonight, but here are three future considerations that we have to pay close attention to that could impact 128 and all Illinois school districts. A, a 0% uh, percent property tax freeze, um, which would mean that there's no additional year-over-year -year tax increase for the district we would truly be frozen, uh, would result in um, obviously no new revenue to the school district. Uh, the pension cost shift, um, um, we're very familiar with, but for our public, uh, simply means shifting normal teacher retirement system pension costs from the state to the local school districts. And to give you a picture of what that would look like, because we've modeled those numbers out, if what Speaker Madigan has suggested over the last few years would happen, um, that would be a half a percent a year, okay, for 12 years to get us to that 6%, what they call normal pension cost, that the state <coughs> now picks up. That would result in that 12-year run-up period of about $18 million in additional cost for our district, and then about $2.5 million every year after that. So when you begin to, again, model some of those numbers out, there's a significant potential impact uh, that could happen. C is a revision of the state school funding formula, which has been under serious discussion for the last two years. We have not revised the state school funding formula for 17 years in this state. It's badly out of whack. It needs to be revised, but we need to realize that um, any revision of that formula will result in districts like ours receiving even less state revenue, and some of that revenue being you know, kind of scooped up from across the state and spread out to districts that are needier than our districts. So we've got a rough, est we have a rough estimation for each one of these individually in several scenarios under here that we know have been discussed in the past. But e any of these would have an impact on us moving forward. However, if the state chose to do A and B or A and C or B and C, and we had a compound effect, there would be a significant impact on the school district. So we want the public to know that we've spent a lot of time talking about these possibilities as it relates to our levy. And the question then comes up, well, should we be abating, you know, if we don't know uh, those dynamics? And again, we've had a lot of discussion about that. Uh, the majority of the board believes that given our financial uh, condition and our tax base in this community, that's important to take this last opportunity to abate because um, 
our bond uh, and interest will be paid off soon, and once that happens, we lose the ability to abate further. So um, the result of that is that $18.6 million when you um, take all of that um, into account. So what about the reserves in the district? Uh, there's been some written, and uh, we've had some communication with some of our local taxpayers about our reserves. We need to understand about the reserves a couple of things. We get our uh, bulk tax payments back from the state um, a couple of times during the year. And when we receive that money, it looks like we have a lot more reserves than we actually have um, in the school district. Um, that's how we pay our bills. So that's how we end up paying teacher salaries and the cost of running the district and all of those things. And I could make an analogy by saying if you were only paid once every six months, Okay, it would look like you had a lot of money, but once you made your mortgage payment, your car payments, your college tuition payments for your kids, uh, you paid your light bill for six months, you did all of those things, you would have a lot less money left in the account. And after a significant analysis of the reserves over the uh, past couple of years, um, we've really worked our, our, our uh, a comfort level in terms of an estimate uh, to 79 or 80 um, million dollars. And from that, the board has determined that um, they want to maintain about $40 million for, um, you know, kind of uh, emergencies moving forward for the future of the district, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. The state recommends roughly a 40% reserve threshold. Many school districts are not able to get to that. We're currently higher than that. The other piece of that $80 million is roughly 35 to $40 million of that has been um, allocated in concept to future large capital projects for the district that will serve the district you know, for the next 25, 30, 40, 50 years um, moving forward. And if you followed the board discussion, we've been talking about that for probably eight years um, moving forward. And what might those projects be? The pool at Libertyville High School needs to be replaced. Uh, if you've ever been in the pool, um, it's um, outdated at this point. It's also very expensive to operate um, moving forward because of the age of the pool and the amount of usage that we get in the pool. Um, if we do the new pool uh, at Libertyville High School, then we would certainly repurpose the old pool for um, uh, academic and curricular use as well as extracurricular use because we have very limited space at Libertyville High School. And the third, uh, the third project on the list would be to um, be able to uh, finally put the second gym in at Vernon Hills, which had to be cut um, when uh, the district ran out of money uh, on the referendum when they were opening Vernon Hills High School. So if you're familiar with Libertyville, part of the addition at Libertyville in the 97 referendum was the addition of the West Gym and some classroom space at Libertyville High School. So if you've been in the West Gym at the end of the building, that would be the type of facility that we would be looking at uh, at Vernon Hills uh, to serve again both curricular and uh, extracurricular uh, needs. The point that's really important here is because of advanced planning, we would be able to okay, carry the cost of those projects without going back to the taxpayers for additional tax revenue. Okay, so in our, we've had a long-range uh, capital plan for a rolling capital plan for the last 10 years, and uh, that has been on our radar screen uh, for a long period of time. So uh, with that in essence, we want the community to know uh, that the board has uh, really aggressively approached our uh, opportunity to abate or not uh, collect taxes under bond uh, and interest in recognition of the tax burden uh, of the area, and by doing that, um, we have uh, lessened the tax burden um, in the area. In fact, we believe from our contacts around the state, uh, to our knowledge, there's never been a property tax body in Illinois that's abated, not collected this amount of tax that it would be allowed to collect under existing uh, tax law, which even has a cap on it. So that's a quick overview of uh, you know, what we've done in abatement in the past. Uh, what we're recommending uh, to the board uh, this evening, and the board's aware, of course, and they've uh, been, um, you know, the drivers in that conversation. Um, so we've got a little history, and uh, we've also talked about the reserve a little bit uh, and our tax dollars coming in. 
And um, going back to our discussions over the past several years, um, what we'd like to have as a target in our reserves and how we would use the balance of the reserves for long-term capital projects. So with that said, we'll really open it up to the board to make any other comments or ask questions to us or among yourselves. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you look at the 0% property tax freeze, and it says that it would be for a defined period of time. Has the board decided what that could look like? Well, that's a great question. It wouldn't be the board that would decide that. It would be the state legislature. And so what they've talked about over the last 15 months is a the potential for a two-year property tax, what we would call 0% property tax cap, but a two-year freeze on property taxes. So any, proper, any uh, public organization that is dependent upon property tax for revenue, um, so schools, park districts, uh, library districts uh, are typically taxing property tax uh, bodies, uh, would be impacted by that and would have to uh, make adjustments if they knew that was coming for a couple of years. Uh, they would have to make adjustments to, ac um, you know, to accommodate for that loss of additional revenue. For example, uh, employee, employee salaries go up every year. So that means your, your budget, if you don't cut someplace else, is automatically going to go up because even if it's 1% or 2%, you're going to have to come up with that additional revenue. You're not going to get that from um, tax revenue. So uh, the concern um, with uh, the property tax freeze is that if you do that for a couple of years, everybody will say, you know, all property taxpayers will say, that's a good thing. My taxes aren't going up. They're frozen where they're at. The practical problem of that on the backside is that once folks get used to that, nobody's going to raise their hand after that and say, okay, it's okay, now you can, you froze my taxes for two years, now you can raise them again. So then it becomes a political issue, which makes it more complicated. So that's, I'm sure, part of the, the discussion they're having uh, downstate. But again, the board, the administration here, you know, we all agree that property taxes are challenging. Um, they're challenging across the state. They're certainly certainly challenging in our area. The board, uh, I live in the community, we're all paying property taxes in any given year. If you count me with the board to make eight, half of our taxes go up, half of our taxes go down, because there are a number of factors that go into the calculation of property taxes. If, if you've got a couple empty houses on your neighborhood and uh, that assessment is down, then the other people in the neighborhood are gonna pay more taxes to balance that up because it's a balanced formula. Um, the last thing regarding that, and this is really kind of uh, related to property um, um, value, is the issue of, of tax rate and the way that it works in our state is it's a balanced formula. So if your equalized assessed valuation goes up in all your properties, okay, then inherently your tax rate is going to go down a little bit because you're just trying to produce the same amount of tax revenue that you're levying for, okay? Uh, conversely, if your EAV or equalized assessed valuation is very low in your community, then you're going to pay a very high tax rate because you have to pay more to get that balance up. So i.e., sometimes people will say to us, well, Lake Forest has you know, such a low tax rate. Why do they have such a low tax rate compared to other communities like, say, Libertyville, Vernon Hills, Green Oaks, uh, the communities that we serve? And the reason for that is their equalized assessed value is about three times, two and a half times our... No, you actually told me this at one point in Lake Forest. Their uh, equalized assessed valuation is much more uh, than it is in our area. So again, the balance, and then it drives the tax rate down because they're able to produce the money that they've levied for. So that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, Pat, any other comments, questions that you guys want to make? Uh, anything I missed here? I, you know, I'll just make a make sure I understand what we're, we're talking about here. Over the last five years, we, we had gotten to the point where we felt our reserves were growing and un, uh, that we felt that we could help the taxpayers by not collecting some of these tax dollars and level out their, their tax bill basically for a number of years. Uh, and we could do that because we had this this bond that we were paying off and we could ease back on that and basically pay our mortgage out of our savings account for, for a few years. Uh, we've now gotten ourselves into a situation where there's some, some things happening or not happening in Springfield, so we're getting a little concerned, so we have to ease off um, 
I think the, the logic for the, the four million was we would like to ease off and not do an abatement because the scary things in, in Springfield may have a significant financial impact on us. Um, but also the realization that if we do not do that, then that would mean a um, pretty significant e increase to the taxpayers' um, tax bill this, this coming year. So I think it, we're trying to balance and ease into a situation where we probably won't be able to abate in the future and we'll probably be more on a, a traditional uh, um, standard increase uh, based on PTEL and uh, based on the tax cap. But um, we felt this one last time we could do sort of a compromise abatement to help us ease back into that mode. Uh, that, that was my understanding. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments they'd like to. Um, procedurally, we have um, we have two big things we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about the tax levy uh, first, and then we're going to come back to this conversation about the, the abatement. So that'll be a second topic that we're going to talk about. For the tax levy, there's five items that we have to do. There's a truth and taxation resolution. There's a resolution for uh, a couple of specific things. One's for special education. Uh, one's for working cash fund levy. Um, once for um, the special education district IMRF, uh, the, the, for the uh, special education district that we uh, are part of, and uh, a fifth one for the uh, leasing of uh, education facilities and or computer technology. So that's... Jim, one other comment before we move um, through the legal requirements of the process. I think it's also important for our community to know that we, we had a fifth, probably a 15-year period of astronomical growth um, in this district, and that increased uh, the equalized assessed valuation dramatically um, over a period of time. So it also generated more tax dollars as a result of that. So if you think of the HSBC, which is now AbV, um, out in the tollway, for example, that would be an example of a corporate property that came on the rolls. If you uh, think about the development of this complex that Vernon Hills High School sets in in the office park here um, in Vernon Hills, um, you know, all was built in a period of time. So as we have that kind of growth in the district, we have the ability to capture that as new growth and bring it on the rolls. And the result of that um, growth is that it generates more tax hours. So, you know, part of the run up that Jim mentioned in the reserves is a result of the astronomical growth that we had in this area prior to the real estate crash in 2006 and 2007. Um, but those properties are on our tax rolls. And yes, I said that correctly, I think. So that's another factor that's, that's played into the reserve piece over a period of time. So I just wanted to thank you. Sure, sure. Okay, so the first item is the uh, truth and taxation resolution. And basically what this is saying is um, that the levy that we're about to uh, vote on, uh, uh, as, it's, as it's written, as it's documented, does not exceed 105% of the previous year's extension. So just so that it doesn't, um, uh, this uh, validates that we didn't go over, increase more than 5% over last year. Which is the PTEL amount, which right. is the, we're limited by 5% or CPI. Can uh, we approve we'll all of these as a yeah. group instead of individually, on, yes. if we just read them? Yes. Okay. Individually? Yeah. No, we can do it all as a group. We can do it all as a group? Okay. So, do, we'll, um, do we have to read the whole thing? Why don't you just okay. read the amounts on the certificate? Yes. Why don't you read the amounts yes. on the certificate? So the, the actual tax levy um, total is, and correct me if I'm wrong, yes, if I'm reading the right part, $74,214,806 is what we're requesting. That is the operating levy, and it also includes the $214,806 from CDOT. Okay. So the district's, uh, the district's operating levy request is at $74 million. It does not include the bond and interest amount. It is separate from that because the resolution for the bond and interest collection was um, filed with the county clerk in 1997 when we filed, okay. uh, when we passed the referendum. Okay. Uh, and if you go roll down to the bottom of the tax levy sheet, you will see 
that although the district initially had 6188000 as its bond and interest, it's shown as $2,188,000 reflecting the $4 million. Okay. okay. So this, this amount does include CEDAW, it does include these other, the special education? Yes. It includes all the items that you see there except for bond and interest. So are they linked? I'm sorry? So these items, all these yes. items listed, they come to a total. Yes. Is B then part of that total? B. B, B is so. Oh, much oh. B, the yeah. B the abatement. Oh, no, it is not. Not part of the 74214000 yeah. Does it include the bond of It does not include it, yes. Right. Right. So um, the, so the, the second part that we're going to, going to come to, to discuss is the abatement and as it's reflected from the bond and interest that was already levied previously is what I'm, what I'm hearing you say. So the working cash fund is not in that $74 million. Um, it is at uh, $1,385,000. But the transfer is not in there. Yeah. All right. Because the transfer is going to come out of fund balance. And the resolution that you're approving tonight basically states that because you're abating, uh, the state law requires that it identify where the additional funds are coming from, and so it's coming from the working cash reserves. Well, let me make that's, sure. let me just okay. clarify that to your to what I think you're asking. All right, so if we approve A, right, <coughs> is approval of A contingent on B? In other words, if B were not to pass, yes, you would not want to pass A. Is that true? That's how it drives it. Yeah. Vote it's, no it's, it's, in other words, you should vote no for A. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, these are, I think what I think, well, I think what Honestly. you're suggesting, maybe B needs to be approved before A, because if B doesn't happen, then 74 million is the wrong number. Um, That's what I was suggesting. No, no because no. the 74 is, is excluding any amount for bond and interest. So you could approve A, it could still be at 74 million, and then you could approve B at either 2.1 million or 6.1 million, yeah. whichever. Or not. Yeah. Or not at or, all. Or not at all. Right. The A, what we're, not, what we're talking A about now, let's stop. We, we need to stop talking about the, the abatement because that's not part of A. A is just the tax levy for the operating funds yes. for the district. It has nothing to do with the abatement. It has nothing to do with the bond and interest. So just the, 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 so you feel comfortable it's not yeah, I'm still not comfortable because my, yeah. my A3, I'm approving uh, of the working fund levy. And then back here, I'm, I'm taking money from the levy, the working fund levy. No, actually, if you were going to approve the entire amount, your uh, total levy would be about $82 million. Understood. Okay. So you're approving 74 plus 2, so in fact, you're abating. Uh, about $4 million then. But is that in the city? It's not in the 74.2. But by approving the, the 74, yes. it, the, the, it Let me see if I can uh, clarify. The $4 million that we're talking about in the transfer later comes from the budget, not from the levy. Is that a fair it statement? It comes from the document that was filed in 1997 and amended last year when we refinanced the bonds. And it's coming from that amount. So basically, any school district that has passed a referendum has filed an amortization schedule with the county clerk saying, whether or not we request the money, you have been directed now on an annual basis to collect the amount that has been stated in the stock. That's bond and interest. Correct. It's not the operating fund. Right. Yes. The, the, the working cash fund levy here is a levy of taxes to come into our district that regardless of whether we abate, that those funds still come in as part of our tax levy. That's correct. They're not impacted one way or the other. The, the information below where it says transfer of funds is transferring from current existing funds. It's not a, a levy. It's not transferring from the levy. It's transferring from funds that we have in the bank. It's not the over and above. <coughs> Does that make sense? I think so. I'm trying to stay true to my... Right. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah, we understand. I think I've got that. Okay. 
So we, we thought it might be helpful if we just read the amounts in and what they're for. Yeah, it's just, yeah, just, tie, just, just for the record. Tie, they tie the two okay, so um, we are, um, we certify that we require the sum of $55,350,000 to be levied as a special ed, uh, special tax for educational purposes, the sum of 12 million to be levied uh, as a special tax for operation and maintenance purposes and $300,000 to be levied as a special tax for transportation purposes. And $1,385,000 to be levied um, as a special tax for working cash fund. $1,420,000 as a special tax for municipal retirement purposes, again, which we're required to pay. Um, another $1,420,000 uh, $1, for social security purposes. Zero dollars to be levied as a special tax for fire prevention, safety, energy, conservation, disabled, accessibility, school security, and specified repair purposes. $850,000 to be levied as a special tax for tort immunity purposes. Um, $1,075,000 to be levied as a special tax for special education. And $200,000 to be levied as a special tax for leasing of educational facilities or computer technology or both in temporary relocation expense purposes. Uh, the sum of zero dollars to be levied as a special tax for um, CEDAL municipal or CEDAL municipal There's retirement. No tax there. There's no tax there. And uh, $214,806 to be levied as a special tax for CEDAL municipal retirement purposes, which we're required to collect and provide. This is from the this comes as a directive from the uh, CEDAL board as to right. how much to collect. So, so the total there then you add all those up at $74,214,806. Yes. Okay, so I'm make a motion. Okay. I make a motion that we approve the board adoption of the certificate of 2015 tax levy and the accompanying resolutions. One, the truth and taxation resolution, the resolution levying tax for special education purposes, the resolution authorizing working cash fund levy, the resolution to levy certain special taxes for special education district IMRF purposes, and the resolution levying tax for leasing education facilities or computer technology or both, and for temporary relocation expenses purposes. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, I think we need a roll call. Deli Pelly. Aye. Grudy. Aye. Luth. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Batson. Aye. Uh, the motion passes. Okay, now the second part of this, now we're going to talk about abatement and this is actually being abated against our bond and interest. Uh, so we currently have a, a, a bond and interest payment due $6,188,988 this year and the proposal is to abate $4 million. This is $6 million is for January 2017 because by the time we collect the entire amount, we will be close to the end of 2016. Right. So, so the motion, the recommendation and the motion would be to abate $4 million from out of bond and interest. interest. To abate the bond and interest levy and to transfer funds from working cash to okay. compensate for that uh, abatement. Correct. So moved. Okay. Give a second. Second. Okay. So further discussion. Anyone have anything they'd like to comment on? So basically, this is the four million that we're, we're we've discussed abating. Okay. No further discussion. Okay. Do we have a roll call? Lundstedt. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Batson. Aye. Deli Pally. Nay. Rudy. Aye. Luth. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. The resolution passes. Yeah, Let me just highlight, I think through the course of the whole budget levy discussions over the last, I think we started before July, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Stop. Very fruitful, very thorough discussions. I appreciate everybody's active engagement in all of these conversations.
Okay. Thank you. Is that it? But, uh, no other. So uh, that concludes the facilities and finance. Okay. No property, no CEDAW. You need a delegate. Uh, December 2nd is the next quarterly meeting for CEDAW. I am not able to attend. Is there anyone that would like to go? What time's the meeting? 7 o'clock. Uh, it's a, um, they're not probably where it usually is. The CEDAW is like the office gate, just like the uh, Wednesday. Um, I'll tentatively uh, do that if I get into a conflict, if you get into a conflict, let me know. I, I don't have my calendar to check, but okay. If you email me, so I, 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 right, so yeah. between Ellen and I, we'll okay. work it out. Great, okay. great. <coughs> if not, I know your number. Um, okay, IASB nothing, uh, and I think that's it. So we're gonna um, uh, adjourn for an executive session um, tonight. We have two topics. One is pending or imminent litigation, ILCS 120/2C11. And the other is a student disciplinary case, uh, ILCS 120 slash 2C9. Um, and taking no action. No action afterwards, so. Um, um, so we, okay. okay, I make a motion that we go into an executive session to discuss pending and, and or imminent litigation and student disciplinary case. Second. Aye. 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 Aye.